All right, we are in Genesis chapter 14 tonight. Got through chapter 13 last night or last week um, on Wednesday. And um, the update on Joshua for all those of you who are worried about him, he did break his arm slightly. Um, wasn't bad. It, it just is a buckle fracture, which means it didn't snap all the way through. But I'm sure he'll finish the job um, probably within the next couple of weeks. He'll break it all the way through, and then we'll have to get a full-on cast. But right now he just has a brace and um, hasn't slowed him down one bit, although the doctor said no activity. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, you have any downers for the kid? Because he's all over the place. <laughs> anyway, so he's fine, but he's, yeah, he has a slight fracture. <clears throat> um, last time we saw Abraham, and he was decided, well, Abram, but remember, we're going to talk about Abraham because the New Testament does it, so I can do it. So even though it says Abram, we're, I'll probably call him Abraham because that's his name later. But in heaven, he's Abraham now, right? So we can refer to him as his present. Anyway, Abraham was um, coming back from Egypt and kind of a failure in his life. And it says Lot was with him. And then they found themselves um, there in Beth, between Bethel and Ai, remember between the heap and the house of God, they find themselves in that middle place and not enough room. There's tension happening between Abraham and Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham and the herdsmen of Lot. And there's just some tension happening. And so, you know, Abraham comes to Lot and he says, you know, hey, this land is not big enough for the both of us. And, and I, don't, I don't want there to be tension between us. I don't want there to be problems between us. And so he says, you know, hey, you know, you, you, if you want to go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you want to go to the left, I'll go to the right. You choose whatever you want. I, I'll get, you know, I'll let you go that way and I'll go the opposite direction. And that, that seems very um, generous of Abraham, if you think about it. I mean, very generous of him to just give up and yield his his will. And yet I think that if we understand the way that God works and the way that God's promises work for us, um, really what uh, Abraham is doing is he's saying, you roll, you roll the, the roulette will, you know, that he knows is already stacked because God has made Abraham promises that he's going to take him to a place that he promised him and give him a land that is his already. And so it's not like Abraham is, is doing anything but just yielding, not so much to Lot, but really yielding to God and saying, God, I'm putting my life in your hands. I am trusting you with what you have told me to do. Because remember, the original deal was, Abraham, get out of your land away from your father's house, away from your family, he said all those things, to a place that I will show you. And Abraham left his land, remember, the Ur of the Chaldees, went to Haran, but what did he do? He took with him his father Terah and Lot and his wife, and everybody came with him. You know, and it was okay for him to take his wife. That was, that was acceptable. But as far as Lot and as far as Abraham, he, he brought his father's house with him and then stayed in Haran for a while till Terah died, his father died. And then they left from there, but then Lot went with him. And so Abraham, in this whole time, in partial obedience to God, has now finally just said yes to God. And, and I think that that's a huge thing in the life of every believer when we will take that moment in our life where God has been talking to us and He's been pushing us and He's been showing us things that He wants to do, but there is this little disobedience, there's this little piece of our life that is unsurrendered. This room in the house that has a lock on the door and Jesus is occupied and he's swept the floors and he's cleaned off the cobwebs and he's occupied the house. He's stored all the junk out except for in that room. And you're like, no, you know, not, you don't have access to this room. There's nothing in here. There's nothing important in there. Just, you, you know, you don't need to worry about it. I promise you, there's nothing, nothing to see here. Just carry on. And yet Jesus says, I want that too. And that's the difficult thing for us because there is an idol in there or there is a precious thing in there. Something that we are not really willing, not ready 
to surrender. And that is what God wants. Because when we make that a yes to God, and we say, open it up, deal with it, you know, be careful, you know, help me. <laughs> you know, because it is hard. It's, it's Sometimes it, it, it hurts a little bit. You know, we don't, we don't surrender everything to God without a little bit of inward bleeding, do we? It, it hurts a little bit. But when, it is, when the band-aid is ripped off, what freedom, what release, what joy there is. And that's when God, remember it says, then God spoke to Abram. That's when God spoke to him and he says, lift up your eyes, Abram, to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south. All of this is yours. I've given it all to you. And that that was a beautiful moment in Abraham's life. No different um, when you read the story biographies of of great Christians. Just one that comes to mind is Brother Andrew. I remember Brother, I don't know if you've ever read the story of the God smuggler, but Andrew had really felt like God was working in his life and and drawing him into relationship with him. And yet Andrew was, he felt kind of um, helpless before God because in the war, (coughs) excuse me, in New Guinea, um, in uh, Dutch New Guinea at the time, he was in a war there and fighting and he got shot in the ankle and his his foot was no good and it was just a really bad situation. But he felt like he wanted God to use him and so he sat up there on the dock in his little Dutch town. He sat there on the, on the um, what do they call those? Not the dock, the pier thing, or the, I don't know, the thing that kept the water from flooding the town because the right. dike, there you think. He sat up on the dike and he um, is looking out over, you know, the land there and just praying. And, and he said, you know what, God, I'm, I'm going to surrender to you. I'm going to give it all to you. I will go if you want me to go. And he said, I'm going to stand up. And he says, this step, this step I'm going to make is going to be a step of yes. And he stepped forward with his hurt foot, with his broken foot that has just he was limping on. And it popped and he screamed out in pain but then he realized that the lord had healed him and he he started to run and he ran and he ran everywhere after that because he was an avid runner before that but god he begins to open our eyes he begins to open the path he begins to set free the captives when we will finally just say yes god whatever you want whatever you want for my life and and, it, and it's it's that little thing, it's just that dumb little thing that just seems so important at the time. You know, I remember <coughs> um, just working with my kids and just trying to help them to see that certain things are not going to be good for them. You know, and they get a hold of something that's like poisonous or you know, no good, like a knife or something like that. And you just want to take it away from them. You just want them to be safe. And it's like they they just get upset because you want to take their precious, that thing that is so important to them and, and, and yet so dangerous to them. And that's really how it is for us as well. You know, we don't see how dangerous things can be that we're trying so desperately to hold on to and we don't want to let go of them. And you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you're thinking about something specific in your life and say, don't even bring that up. You know, a while back, a a woman came to me and she said, every time you said something like that, you were talking about my precious. She said, I wanted to throw my Bible at you. She said, I knew you were talking about my habit. And I was was always, you know, spending a lot of money on this habit. And I I didn't want to let go of it. It's natural. You know, why would I get rid of that? You know, and... And God, every time I said that, she says, God was like putting his finger on me. And she says, I'm free. You know, I just wanted to tell you I'm free. She said, ask me about my precious. (laughs) I'm free from it now. You know, and that's the reality of it. You know, we think it's no big deal. If it's no big deal, then why are you worried about it? Right? If it's no big deal, then why do you hide it? Why do you do it in secret? If it's no big deal, why does it bother you with the suggestion that maybe that's not good for your life? And, and I think that it's important that we realize that in our own lives. And God is speaking to all of us about different things. Something that might be permissible to you is not permissible to someone else. And I want us to be careful of that as well. I have a friend who, um, 
he went to a, a Bible study. He was a brand new Christian, and he he went to a Bible study. That his, somebody his mom had um, his mom had a friend who was holding it, and he just had moved to where his mom was, and they were sitting in this little room, and and this woman um, asked my friend Ben. She said, "Do you have a TV?" And he says, "Yeah, it's in storage, but yeah, I got one." She said, "Well, you'll have to get rid of it." And he's like. No, I don't have to get rid of it. She's like, we've all gotten rid of our TVs. And he's like, well, that's good for you, but um, I'm not getting rid of my TV. <laughs> you know? So they kind of had this little conversation. And, w- and what had happened, I guess, in that situation was one woman who was um, legitimately convicted of her abuse of her television set. She was watching things she shouldn't have been watching and not anything nasty or perverted, but she was just over watching. She was basically glued to this thing 24 seven. And the Lord spoke to her about it and said, you know what? I think you need to get rid of that TV. It is an idol in your life. And so she did. And then she came to Bible study and she shared what a wonderful thing it was that the Lord told her to get rid of her TV and, and how she's free from it now. And, and somebody very religious in the group, said, well, I think that we all should get rid of our TVs. And everybody else thought, well, that's just wonderful. Yeah, let's do that. So they all got rid of their TVs, even though God had only spoken to one person about their TV. See, it's so easy to become religious and then be proud of ourselves. Well, we all don't watch TV. We're we're the non-TV Christians, you know, or whatever. So I'm not talking about that. But what I'm talking about, because there's a lot of things that could be prideful, you know, we could do them out of pride. But what I'm talking about is that thing, that lot that God has said, this is not good for your life. And maybe it is a friendship. And maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's, you know, a TV. I don't know. But God is speaking to you about it. And that's, that's the key um, to that freedom, to let go of what God is telling you to let go of in your life and saying yes to God. Yes, God, I want to follow you. And then God says, lift up your eyes and see what I have for you. And that's kind of what, where Abraham is at. And that lot... On the other hand, to to juxtaposition Lot against Abraham, to, to see his plot, he goes and he finds himself looking out at the plains of Jordan and how well watered they are and how beautiful they are and how much g- fertile grass and everything there is for his flocks and herds. And he says, I want to I camp down there. I'm going to go that direction. You can have the wilderness out here. I'm going to take the well-watered plain. And he goes out there and he pitches his tent next to Sodom. And of course, I think we probably all have enough biblical literacy to understand where that's headed, right? Sodom and Gomorrah, not a good scene. Not a good scene. And yet he camps his tent next to Lost Wages, (laughs) Las Vegas, you know, um, of the Jordan River. You know, I mean, he... He's in a bad, bad place. And verse 1, it says, It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. And of course, this is the king of Babylon. Shinar is Babylon. <coughs> Arioch, king of Elasar. Chadodelamar, king of Elam. This is, oh, what was Elam? I can't remember. You, you have to look him up on your own. That's your homework. <laughs> Title, king of nations. That they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, um, Shinab, king of Adam, Adma, I can, I can mispronounce them as well as you can, so, um, Shember, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, all these joined together in the valley of Siddam, that is the Salt Sea. So where the Salt Sea is now, of course, that's the Dead Sea, that's the kind of the end of the Jordan River and the Jordan River just pours into the Dead Sea and from there it goes nowhere it just evaporates this is kind of the end of the line for the Jordan River and so what happens is um, all the sediment that comes down through that valley that the Jordan River flows through down into um, the Dead Sea is just being stripped of all its minerals and all the salt that's in the earth and everything's just getting poured into the Dead Sea and then it evaporates from there. And so that sea is so salty that you can literally go, I mean, you can take a glass and you can stick, a, you know, fill up a glass of the water and let it completely evaporate and it will be over half full with just sediment. It's so thick with minerals and salt and you can go out onto the sea 
and lay on it and you just float kind of halfway in because it's so thick with sediment that it, you just kind of sit there in the water um, and it doesn't you can't really get down into it because it's just so thick and and so at this time the Dead Sea was not dead this was a valley this was just a valley probably where the river maybe even flowed through but this would be um, where the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, it's believed that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are there underneath the Dead Sea, what's left of them, possibly. So verse 4, it says, 12 years they served Chadodelamar, and the 13th year they rebelled. And the 14th year, Chadorlamar, whatever his name is, and the kings that were with him came and attacked the um, Rephaim, the Ashtoreth, Karim, the Zuzim, the Ham, in Ham, the Emim, in the in um, Shiva, Kithurium. I don't know. I listened to all these names, but it didn't help. You know, I listened to them again and again and again to try to so I can pronounce them at least like the guy who read them did, but I still can't. And the Horites and their mountain of Seir, as far back as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. <clears throat> so basically what happened, and just so you understand kind of the culture and the way that things worked in the ancient world, is if you were a, a city, and, and a lot of times they had very small regions and they had these vassal kings, there might have been a larger kingdom that had um, rule over those kings, but all those kings would be kings of their city, but then there might be a more powerful king or a, or a bigger um, king that ruled over all of the kings. So in a sense, kind of like governors of cities now, they had kings over their cities. And what would happen is when somebody thought that they were better than everybody else, they'd pile an army together and they'd go out and attack these cities. And if they won, then those cities became their vassal. And so that means that that's an under king who pays tribute or money back to the more powerful king. And in this case, the king of Shinar, who was the king of Babylon, that, that's where Babel was in the plain of Shinar. He was the one who was kind of saying, hey, these guys are all going to be under my power. And so he went and he attacked all them and they were all paying. For 13 years, they paid him just every year um, an amount of money so that he wouldn't come and destroy their city. But in the, thir in the 14th year, they said, or the 13th year, they said, no way. We're not paying you anymore. Forget about it. And, um, in the 14th year, he came and took them over and um, basically <coughs> um, he uh, basically said, you know, you're, you're going to be um, taken away, you know, basically punished for what you've done. Verse 7, it says, then they turned back and came to En Misfat, that is Kadesh, and attacked all the countries of the Amorites and also the Amorites who dwell in Hezaz, Hezon, Tamar. Now, when it, you'll notice here as we're going through, it, it gives us, it says that is this place or that is that place. And the reason it's doing that is because it's giving us the ancient name of the city that he's attacking, but then he's also giving us at the time of the writing and, you know, as the children of Israel have settled into their um, their places or where they're going to be, the, the, the names of the, how, what the places are were currently and you're going to see that because it, later on it's going to talk about the um as far as dan and dan was in the north of israel but that actually wasn't dan until much later so it's just kind of for for their context for us it may not help very much um but as far as katie they attacked all the country of the amalekites and also the amorites who dwell in hezaz tamar verse eight and the king of sodom and the king of gomorrah and the king of adama the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Siddam against Chadadelamar, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elasar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddam was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. And so, um, again, you see you have this whole area that's full of asphalt pits, which is, you know, bitumen. You know, it's basically uh, what we make asphalt out of, you know, the tar. And um, th you think about that later on, God is going to rain fire and brimstone upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they're going to burn for a long time. And this is probably why, because there's a lot of asphalt 
in the area. <coughs> Excuse me. But you just think about, you know, just to get an idea of what this is like. I don't know if you ever, uh, if you remember when Saddam Hussein um, lit all of his oil wells on fire. Remember that? And like all the, the whole country was burning. I remember seeing a, a picture from space, from a satellite image photo of Iraq um, before. And then when he lit them all on fire and everything was just black because, you know, they burned forever. And finally we got them out. But that's, that's kind of the idea of, you know, all these asphalt pits, a lot of oil. And yet it's interesting, too, it's because of these types of statements that um, Rockefeller, in a Bible study one day, noticed it kept talking about asphalt pits and tar and all this in the Middle East. And he decided, you know, I bet... If we went over there and dug for oil, we would find it. And guess what? They found oil, and that's why that's what fund ter- funds terrorism today. You know? And yet the Bible is, is what you know basically um, let people know that that was there. So pretty amazing. Verse eleven it says, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and their provisions and went their way. And they also took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods and departed. So remember in chapter 13, Lot had pitched his tent in the Jordan plain, in the well-watered plain next to Sodom, but the proximity was too much for him to handle. And you think about it, you know, I mean, if you think about it from a worldly perspective, yeah, there's a lot of money to be made. There's a lot of opportunity to be had. I mean, he had all these camels and herds. He could sell all those off, downsize, move into the city, become an important man. He'd have all kinds of cash. And he could really make a life for himself and a name for himself in a prominent and important city. And so he finds himself identifying with with the world, if you will. Basically becoming important. Later on, we're going to find that he sits in the gate of the city, meaning he was a councilman, if you will, you know, a city councilman for the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, making decisions and and kind of one of the leaders. And yet this is a very, very wicked and depraved place. It's amazing to me how desensitized, how quickly desensitized we can become to something when we expose ourselves to it just a little bit at a time. And, and how, I mean, we just look at our country, you realize in, in, um, in the 80s, in 1983 still, homosexuality was considered a mental illness. And if somebody were to come out and say, you know, I'm homosexual, they would actually put them in an institution, and give them therapy to help them through those abnormal thoughts. I mean, is it normal for you to have a, an attraction to somebody of the same sex as you? Is that a normal thing? Well, they thought not. And, and a lot of countries around the world still think that that is a mental disorder. There's something wrong with you if you have an attraction with somebody of the same sex. Now, if you think about it biologically, it's not, it's not compatible, right? You can't produce offspring. Um, and so they would look at it that way. They'd say there's something wrong. But then you notice as we've just gone through, you know, um, TV has desensitized us to that. And the culture has changed quite a bit in the last 30 or so years, 30, 30, um, 40 years maybe since then. The the culture has completely changed, hasn't it? And now it's like, well, that's that's normal. You know, that's normal behavior. In fact, it could even be a preferred lifestyle. You know, I mean, if you think about it, we should teach our children about this in case they decide they want to become homosexual. And, And so you can see how just in a short period of time, and 30 years is not a long period of time, the values of a culture complete, can completely change. And, you know, I know just even saying this, and I don't even know if any, probably nobody here is shocked by that, but, um, you know, when you talk to people just out on the street today, um, you know, and I think probably all of us have somebody who claims to be a homosexual in our family. I do I have family members that say they're homosexual. Um, and are living that lifestyle. Um, and, and that's a very difficult thing for our culture because we just become desensitized to it. 
And, and, and having said that, I think that in all things, Christians should always be the ones who reach out in love towards people who um, are in that situation. You know, I don't think that by any means we should ever promote hate or act hateful towards someone else who, who needs Jesus, right? But the reality is, is it, it isn't normal behavior, and nor was the homosexuality that was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah normal behavior. It, I mean, it reached far worse levels there um, than most places have ever gotten. And yet, um, Lot, who the Bible says, and this is what's really difficult for us, it says that the people of Sodom and their, and their behavior vexed his righteous soul. Now, reading Lot here, that seems very, very gracious, doesn't it? That he was a righteous soul. <laughs> and yet, that's what the, the New Testament tells us of Lot, that he was righteous. And in fact, it would prove to be true when the angels come to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy the city for its wickedness that has made its, its way, the cries of its wickedness have made its way up to the ears of God. It was so wicked that God would send down angels to destroy the city that they would have to get Lot out first because God's not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. And yet, looking at Lot's life and seeing that he was, by God's standards, righteous, helps us to understand that God's standard of righteousness is very different than what we might think righteousness is. Well, obviously, he destroyed the city, so he didn't think the city was righteous or what they were doing was righteous. But it's interesting because the Bible also tells us that what was Sodom and Gomorrah's sin is that they had fullness of food, they were idle, and they did not strengthen the hands of the poor and needy. That's what God said about Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why he destroyed them. It says because of that, he gave them up to vile passions. So it wasn't directly from homosexuality that he destroyed them, but rather because their fullness of food idleness of time and not taking care of the poor and needy he gave them up to homosexuality and then later destroyed the city now that should be terrifying to us as a culture fullness of food which we all are feeling right now idleness not doing good things with your time and then there's the strength in the hand of the poor and needy which I think is probably the, the most important of the three you know, when you're full of food, when you have food, when you have idleness of time, and there are people who are needy, and there are people that are hungry, then we should, as Christians, say, how can we help? You know, as even as a culture, but as Christians especially, how can we help? But that's that was God's thought towards that. But what made Lot righteous was something far different. I would, I would submit to you far much more different than whether or not he lived amongst a homosexual society or even turned a blind eye to that sometimes what made him righteous what made him righteous was that he believed the promises that god gave to abraham that through abraham's line the messiah was going to come in fact that's always what makes somebody righteous it's really interesting because god tells abraham I'm going to make you a seed. It's, you know, through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And Abraham understood that I would submit to you that Abraham understood that God was saying that through his seed, the promises back in Genesis chapter 15, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. He understood that that promise was going to be fulfilled through him. And so too... Esau and Jacob, later on as we'll get into that, Esau and Jacob saw this promise being passed down to them, being 15 years old when Abraham died, they would have heard about it. Even if their father Isaac hadn't told them. They knew that the birthright of the chosen son, Esau, would be that the Messiah would come through his line. And guess what? Esau hated it. He despised his birthright. Jacob loved it. 
I want that birthright. I want the Messiah to come through my line. And he set it up, you know, had his bowl of soup there, and Esau gave away his birthright for a bowl of soup. He profaned the coming of Christ for a bowl of soup, for his belly. And that's why in Malachi, God says, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. Not because God hated Esau, but he hated the unbelief of Esau. He hated the rejection of Christ of Esau. But he loved, even though Jacob was a scoundrel, he loved the faith of the man who said, I want the Messiah to come through my line. I believe that promise. I think that's important. I want that for me. And so too for you and me, it is our faith in Christ that makes us righteous. It was, it was Abraham's faith in the promise of the seed that made him righteous. It was, it was Jacob's faith in the promise of the seed that made him righteous. And so too with Lot. Nobody is made righteous aside from their understanding that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, has come to undo what the serpent did in the Garden of Eden, to take away sin. That's what makes us righteous, is putting our faith in Him. Whether you're Abraham, Lot, and Lot's a mess. He's a hot mess all the way through. We don't see anything but mess from Lot. I mean, he goes for what he thinks is going to be best for him financially. He goes for a city that's made by man, that looks like stellar. And he ends up in a cave with his daughters pregnant by him unbeknownst to him, the Amorites and the Moabites. And Abraham looks for a city whose builder and maker is God, and he receives the inheritance that God had promised him. Such a beautiful contrast between the two, um, dwelling in tents and finally, of course, entering into the city when he passed away, of course, but, but then his descendants, the promises would be fulfilled through them. Such a beautiful contrast. So they took all the goods. They took Lot. And of course, we remember Proverbs fourteen twelve. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Verse 13, it says, Then one who had escaped came and told Abram. There's always one guy that escapes. You realize that? It seems like every time there's one guy that escapes. Everybody dies in Job's house, but one guy escapes to come tell Job. This one guy escapes. He comes and tells Abram the Hebrew. Now, this is an interesting thing because Hebrew is the first place it says Hebrew in the Bible. You guys realize that? So I'll read the verse. It says, One told um, and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in, um, in the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eschol, and the brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. So Abram's kind of dwelling with these guys, these Amorites. And um, this guy comes and tells him. Now, Hebrew is an interesting word. And um, I mentioned before, and a lot of commentators believe that Hebrew came from, and we talked about this, didn't we, the other day, that it came from the word Eber. But I read in a commentary yesterday, it was, I found it really fascinating, actually David Guzik's commentary on um, Genesis, that Hebrew um, actually comes from a root that means... Um, to be passed over. And, and it also can mean, or it can mean passenger, you know, or somebody who's, you know, travel, a traveler. But I thought that was interesting that it would be somebody who was passed over considering um, what happens in Egypt, right, with the Passover. So I don't know. It's a pretty interesting word. But um, where the word came from or what exactly it means is, is a little bit elusive. But it could be from Eber. It could mean past those those who are passed over or those who are passengers i don't know um but um abraham now is uh hearing this news that his brother lot now it calls him his brother and you'll notice in the bible and i think i want to just clear this up because i don't want you to be confused about it that when somebody is a relative if they are a descendant they can be called a son so remember jesus is the son of david you know, even though David was 14 generations before Jesus or whatever it was, um, he, he's still the son of David because he's a direct descendant of him. Now, this is his nephew, but it calls him his brother. So it, it works both ways. Um, but anyway, so Lot, he finds out that Lot is in trouble. And, and I think that this is important to realize because Lot 
didn't have to come this far with Abram. He could have left him back in Ur of the Chaldees, but Lot came with him. And God told him to leave his family, and now he has to kind of deal with the choices that he's made. And this is something that Abraham's going to learn a lot about in his life. Do you realize, I think it's, it's September, right? September madness. All kinds of stuff happens in September. All the prophecy people are excited about what's going to happen in September this year. You know, every year. Um, they're all excited and they all talk and everything. And we find out that um, Jonathan Kahn was wrong again. And, you know, and the, all these people, everybody says it's going to happen in September and it never does, right? Remember, the, it was that guy, Harold Camping was wrong, you know, all these people wrong. But um, one thing about September is that we, at the beginning of September means a lot to us, September 11th, because of what happened just a few years ago, right? 9 we remember um, 9-11, when two planes wrecked into the World Trade Centers and they collapsed. Whose fault was that? Could that have been avoided? Did somebody make a mistake early on that could have avoided all of that? Abraham. You realize that? Abraham took his handmaiden, Hagar, who bore to her Ishmael. Ishmael is the one that the Muslims claim to be the one who was the true son of the promise. And Islam is all based on that. And the people of Ishmael are the main force behind the Islamic state in all the, you know, all this trouble. Just think about that. A guy made a mistake when listening to God and the promise God gave him that his wife Sarah was going to bear a son, and two World Trade Centers fall two thousand years or four thousand years later. Isn't that crazy? How our little, one little mistake can make such a big mess moving forward. Kind of freaks you out about mistakes. It kind of freaks you out about those things that you hold on to. I mean, it kind of freaks you out about when your wife says, hey, you know, um, take this young girl and have a child with her. <laughs> Sounded like a good idea at the time. Uh, no, not a good idea at all. Um, anyway, Lot was one of those mistakes that Abraham made. And so now he has to clean up this mess. Verse 14, it says, Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Of course, Dan wasn't there yet, right? So they're given the future name of the area. And divided his forces against them by night. And he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, Hobah, which is north of Damascus. Now, Damascus, we, we talked about that on Sunday, didn't we? The city of Damascus. Damascus is the oldest city in the world. It's named here. It's still there. Do you realize the largest restaurant in the entire world is in Damascus? It, it's like five football fields big, just one restaurant, all under one roof. It's huge. And staffs, massive staff. Anyway, that's just a little fact. But um, oldest city in the world. Damascus. And so Abraham goes all the way, chases these guys all the way. And it gives us a little bit of perspective too on Abraham's wealth. Now, when you thought of Abraham leaving Egypt and you thought of him, you know, having herds and camels and donkeys and servants, you probably didn't get the picture of how vast his little empire was. Think about this. 318 trained for military action. He had a trained militia. Now these guys are going to be between the ages of 20 or 18 maybe and 40, probably 21 and 40, somewhere in there. Born in his house. All 318 of these kids were born in his house, made it made the grade to be part of the militia. And so there might have been guys their age that weren't, you know, maybe they were halt or you know, flat-footed or whatever, I don't know, whatever their criteria was, these guys aren't good enough to fight. 318 who could fight in his house, that were born in his house. And that means they have moms and dads. That means they have grandparents. That means they have children. Kind of gives you an idea of the vastness of this little empire that Abraham is in charge of. I mean, this is, this is, this is serious. And we're trying to think of this little guy, you know, he's out there by himself. No, herds and donkeys, and camels, and gold, and silver. This guy has a lot. that He can just say, 
muster up the troops out of the house. <laughs> you know, and they're all living in tents too. I mean, it would have been intense. So they get these 318 guys that were born in his house all together. And, um, and what Abraham does here, I want you to understand, and, and most people don't um, highlight this, and I didn't really see anybody highlight this, but what he does here is miraculous on the level of David and Goliath. Miraculous on the level of Gideon's 300 against the Midianites with their thousands, hundreds of thousands, remember? That's what this is. And, you know, we don't really think about it. If you watch Roma Downey's cheesy version of the Bible, you they go into this little camp and, you know, a bunch of guys fight and then, you know, and it wasn't like that at all. We're talking a, a, a empire, pretty much. Several kings, five kings that they go up against with 300 guys and win. And his, his idea is probably we're going to sneak in there at night. We're going to snag lot. We're going to get out. But they get in there and they realize, wait a minute, we're winning this battle. This isn't even possible. And they start to fight and they drive them <coughs> all the way out. And so verse 16, it says, so he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother lot and his goods as well as the women and the people. Now, this is an interesting word. This word Hebrew here in Hebrew for people means people. That's what it means. And that's important because it's not going to mean people in a minute. And I think that that's, it's significant. So he brings back all the people. All the people who were taken were brought back in. All the goods Notice that. There's nothing missing. Nobody was lost. None of his people were lost. Verse 17, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shave, um, that is the king, the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Chaldelamar and the kings who were with him. So the king of Sodom was on his way to meet Abram, but notice this, then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram the, of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed the God um, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand and he gave him a tithe of all. So th think about that. Think about what that says. This guy comes out um, from the ancient city of Jebus, which is was Salem. Then this would be the city that would later be called Jerusalem. Um, we don't know anything about this except this guy who is the king of J. Boos or, or Salem here um, comes out and blesses Abraham. And he calls him Abraham of God Most High. And he, Melchizedek, is a priest of the God Most High and the king of Salem. That's really interesting because as we move forward into the Bible and we see um, God establishing the priests, remember that all the priests came from what tribe? Levi. Yeah, remember, if you want to be a priest, you, could not, you couldn't just be a priest. If you wanted to be a priest, you had to have Levi genes, right? <laughs> Everybody's awake now. You had, to have, you had to have that be from that tribe. And then, of course, Aaron was from the tribe of Levi, Levi, and the high priest had to be a descendant of Aaron. And so if you wanted to be a high priest, you had to be from the tribe of Levi, from the family of Aaron. You had to be part of that. And if you weren't from the tribe of Levi, you couldn't be a priest. And yet here's a guy. Oh, and another thing, unless you were from the tribe of Judah, you couldn't be a king, right? Well, that's not true. I guess Benjamin had a king, but the king, the Messiah was going to be from the tribe of Judah. That was the kingly tribe, right? So um, you couldn't be a king if you were a priest. And if you were a king, you couldn't be a priest. There was no, remember when Saul tried to be a priest and he sacrificed to God and God said, I have ripped your kingdom from you and given it to somebody better than you because you, you know, weren't supposed to do that. It wasn't his place to sacrifice. And so it's kind of a, a touch thing. Do you realize there's only three that are called that, that hold an office of king and priest in the Bible? The first one is Melchizedek. Who's the second one? 
Jesus, yeah, Jesus is the second one. Who's the third one? That's tricky. I'm trying to trick you a little bit. Who's the third one? Jeremiah knows I can tell by his smile. Who's the third one that's a, that's a king and a priest? Church? Yeah, us. Yeah, you. If you put, if put your faith in Jesus, it says he will make us kings and priests, right? After the order of Jesus, right? But Jesus, it's interesting because it, it talks about him. Well, turn with me to Psalm 110. Let's just look at this psalm. And this is, of course, what they call a messianic psalm. <coughs> it doesn't mean that it's messy. It means that it's about the Messiah. It's a messianic verse means or messianic psalm. And in Psalm 110, better move quicker. It says, a psalm of David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. That's interesting. The Lord is saying to another Lord. The the Lord says to my Lord. And who is that? Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool. Who does the Lord God, who who does Yahweh, the God of the universe, say, sit at my right hand? To Jesus, yeah. So we're, it's the Messianic Psalm. It's about the Messiah. The Lord shall send a rod, your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauty of his holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew for your youth. The Lord is sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. That's interesting. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute judges or execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. So here is a a messianic psalm, not only of, of Jesus ruling with God, but him be given power and given this uh, the priestly authority of Melchizedek, which is really bizarre. This guy, this obscure guy from the Old Testament. And we really wouldn't know anything about Melchizedek other than this bizarre psalm that says that Jesus or the Messiah would be of the order of Melchizedek or, you know, he's going to be um, a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek until we get to the book of Hebrews. And the Hebrews does a, a complete study on this whole thing. Now, when you think of the Melchizedek priesthood, this has nothing to do, let me just say this, has nothing to do with Mormonism. Mor- <laughs> Mormons have taken piecemeal from here and there in the Bible, and they've kind of developed their own theology about it. But in the book of Hebrews, it talks about it, um, specifically relating to Christ. So Hebrews 5, turn with me to Hebrews 5. This is the first mention of it in the New Testament. And Hebrews is the only place that it's mentioned. And he says, So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. Of course, he couldn't be high priest um, in the order of Aaron, right? Because he was from the tribe of Judah, right? Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. But it was he who said, You are my son, today I have begotten you. He also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And so he's saying that Jesus' priesthood comes from this Melchizedek in the Old Testament. But it kind of develops it as we go in through the book of Hebrews. Turn with me one chapter over to chapter 6. In verse 17, it says, Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. And so we're, we're fleeing to Jesus to grab on to the promises of God. It says, this hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, we, where the forerunner has entered before us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So again, it tells us Jesus, who has paid the price for us, he has given us these promises, he went in before the veil, 
to offer himself as a sacrifice as a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, who is this Melchizedek? Hebrews chapter 7. Turn one more chapter over. It says in verse 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, see it calls him Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, be, first being translated king of righteousness, that's what the word of word Melchizedek means, king of righteousness, and then also the king of Salem, which is he was the king of Salem, um, the city of Salem, meaning king of peace, so Melchizedek is the king of righteousness and he's the king of peace without father or mother or without genealogy having neither beginning of days nor end of life but made like the son of God remains a priest continually now it's because of this that many believe that Melchizedek indeed was a, a theophany which is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ now whether he was a theophany or whether he was a type of Christ, I don't know that we could ever um, fully know the answer to that question. But moving on, he says, Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi who received the priests would have, com- have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. So Melchizedek blessed Abraham. So Abraham was greater than, or excuse me, Melchizedek was greater than Abraham because the less is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is a witness that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So basically saying that Levi had not yet been born, but he was still, the potential of him was still in Abraham when Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. And so therefore, Levi, being in Abraham, tithed to Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is greater. You understand that logic? It's kind of interesting. But he goes with that. Verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were through Levitical priesthood, for under it people received the law, what father or what further need was there for another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priest being charged of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he or change, excuse me, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there's also a change of the law. For he whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at an altar. For it is evident that the Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood, and yet there is a far more evident, yet it is far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of the fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So basically saying that he's a priest forever means he's going to live forever, and that's what Jesus is. For on one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because it is of, it is weak, of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said, the Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were, Um, prevented by death from continuing, but he, because he continues forever, is an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he also, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need 
um, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first of his own sin, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as a high priest men who have weaknesses or weakness, but the word of but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. And so basically saying that Jesus becomes a better priest because he doesn't have to offer up for his own sin, but by his own sacrifice, his own offering, he has, it will tell us in, in Hebrews chapter 10, perfected forever those who he is sanctifying. So those people who he is making holy have been made perfect forever according to Jesus's sacrifice because he is a high priest who never dies. And that's kind of the idea behind this. And, it, you know, how the author of Hebrews got all of that out of those two little pieces, Genesis and Psalm 1. Um, what is it? Psalm 104. Is that what it was? Psalm 110. Um, it, it's it's mind-boggling. But by the Holy Spirit, um, he reveals that Jesus has a better priesthood. Not one that came from the law, but one that was established far before who the patriarch Abraham submitted himself to. And so this is very beautiful. Abraham gives him a tithe. Abraham takes communion. Isn't that significant? He brings out bread and wine, and Abraham eats with him. And so after Abraham meets with, with the king of righteousness, the king of peace, after he's been before that prince of peace, and, and just basking in the glory of that experience, Verse 21, now the king of Sodom <laughs> said to Abraham, give me, you can hear the hiss of the serpent here, give me the persons. Now this word does not mean people. This word in the Hebrew means souls. Isn't that creepy? Give me the souls and take the goods for yourself. Give me the souls of men and you can have the money. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting contrast. We see Melchizedek comes and tells Abraham, the victory is his by the hand of God. God has given this to you. And the king of Sodom says, you can have the stuff. The devil, I mean, excuse me, the king of Sodom comes to Abram and says, literally, give me the souls. As if it's his place to give anything to Abram. Didn't Abraham take everything? Didn't Abraham go and rescue all of that and take it? And if you lost it and somebody else found it, isn't it rightfully theirs now? In a sense, you couldn't defend it yourself. I mean, as if the king of Sodom has any part or parcel in this at all. And he says, you go ahead and keep the stuff. You keep my stuff. But notice what Abram says to him. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from the thread of a sandal strap, that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I made Abram rich. There's something much more to that than just I want to be humble and I don't want to take anything from you. He says, I made an oath to God that I would not take anything from you. And I think that that's the way we have to be when it comes to the devil. I made an oath from God. I'm not going to take anything that is not given to me by God. I'm not going to take anything from you. I'm not going to, to, I'm not going to let you boast, look, I made that man what he is. I made that man great. And he says, except only that the young men have what the young men have eaten. So what his soldiers had eaten on their way and the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Eskel, and, and Mamre, um, let them take their portion. So these guys who were living, these Amorites who were living with Abram, his friends, they went with him to help out. And um, they, he says, let them have their part. But I think it's important. You know, we look at this and... We see Abraham's a different guy, don't we? This isn't the same guy who went down to Egypt that day, was it? Said, you know, there's a famine in the land. We need to get out of here and find some help from Egypt. This is a different man. 
a man who's trusting the Lord, at least at this point in his life. He's trusting the Lord, and God delivers this great victory into his hands. And yet, what's beautiful about it is he acknowledges that it was from God. He ties to Melchizedek and, and gives glory to God for the whole thing. And so too should we. Let's pray.